Okay, this is our first podcast on kinetics, which is chapter 14. And in this podcast, we're going to talk about introduction to kinetics, um, collision theory, and reaction rates. So when we're talking about kinetics, we're really just talking about speed. And specifically, we're talking about the speed in which chemical reactions take place. Um, so while uh, miles per hour is a rate, in this unit we're going to be talking more about things like concentration changes over time. But speed is just a, or rate is just a change in some something over some unit of time, right? How fast is something changing? In kinetics is largely experimental, which means um, as opposed to a topic that has a lot of theory, this is a topic where if you're trying to determine the speed of a reaction, you actually go run the reaction, you collect a bunch of data, and then you apply some fundamentals on solving the, the rate questions. So let's say I have a reaction where I have some reactant A that is being transformed into a reactant B. What I can actually do is uh, put the reactants together. So I'm going to start with all A and monitor over time what happens to my concentration of each of these re reactants and products, right? So over time, my amount of A, which is what I'm starting with, goes down as my amount of B, which starts at zero, goes up. Okay. So if I wanted to know the rate of this reaction, I can determine, I can follow just what's happening with A or what is happening with B. Okay, so we can monitor the change in, in A or B if I have, um, let me go back a second, if I have, let's say, something more complex, and I have A plus B gives me C plus D, I can monitor any one of these four, okay? I can monitor B or D. They will all give me the same answer about rate. Okay, so there are several factors that affect the rate of uh, reactions. And it really comes down to how effective your collisions are. Because unless two substances, molecules or atoms, can, can collide in the right way, they will not react. Okay, so you can imagine one of those things that's going to impact the effectiveness of the collisions is the temperature, because as you know, temperature increases the speed of the particles. And if I have a higher temperature, my particles are going faster, and if they're going faster, they're going to collide more often. Okay? So what do you think some of the other factors are that affect how fast a reaction occurs? Well, another one is certainly going to be concentration. So if I have a lot of reactant to start, I'm going to have more product being made faster than I will if I have less reactant to start. It also depends on the nature of the reactant. So for example, if I have this big macromolecule and the reactant site that's important is located right here, it's going to react um, more slowly than if I have this little tiny molecule that has the reactant site available because there's going to be lots of collisions on this molecule that are not effective. And when you get to the AP test, you want to talk about effective collisions, okay? So the nature of the reactants, the larger they are, the slower they tend to be. It's also affected by physical state. So, and this really comes down to what's happening with surface area. So if you can imagine, let's say I have a, a, a solid, an ionic solid, and I want it to react, and it's, um, you know, a, a crystalline shape. You know, what's going to react faster, that solid like that, or that solid dissolved in water where those particles are separated and hydrated? Well, of course, it's going to 
react faster if the particles are separated because I have a whole lot more surface area exposed. Even if it's not ionic, even if this was a sugar, let's say, and the sugar was dissolved so I have individual molecules, it's gonna it's gonna react a whole lot faster if more surface area of the of the reactant is exposed. So it's a surface area effect, solids are gonna be slower, solutions are gonna be faster. And the last thing is something really artificial is, is a, for many chemical reactions in industry, a catalyst is used. Okay, so a catalyst, as you probably know, is something that speeds up the reaction but doesn't get consumed in the reaction. We're going to talk more about catalysts later, but if it's a catalyst, it can speed up the reaction. There are actually some catalysts that will slow down a reaction. Sometimes that's desired, but usually they're there to speed things up. Okay, so if I wanted to determine the reaction rate of reaction for this molecule um, reacting with water, okay, and, and giving me these, I can run a reaction and measure what's happening to this butyl chloride as the reaction goes, right? And as you see, it starts off, let's say, 0.1 molar is what I put into my flask, and the amount of reactant goes down as it gets consumed, right? So I can analyze this data to determine the rate that this reaction is occurring. So I can actually determine the overall rate, the average rate here, right? The average rate, I can say if I start with uh, 0.1 molar, and I get down to zero, then my difference in, in molarity or concentration is 0.1, right? And my time is 10,000 seconds. So I could determine my overall by looking at the change in, in this case, concentration over the change in time. Now, just to make sure everybody knows that when we talk about concentration and we use brackets, we're talking about the molarity or moles over liters, right? Okay. So mol change in um, molarity of something divided by a change in time. Now I can also determine the instantaneous rate, right? So the instantaneous rate um, would be the rate, rate at any given time during the reaction. So I can look at what's the rate here in the first 50 seconds or between time 200 and 300 by still looking at uh, what's happening with the change in concentration over a change in time. And if I do that, I get these kinds of numbers for my rate. My rate will be in, the units would be molarity per second, right? So how is the concentration changing with my unit of time? And what you see is, not only does the concentration go down over time, right? Whoops. My concentration goes down, but my rate at which those reactants are reacting goes down because I have less stuff. As I use up my reactant, I have less of it available for colliding, right? And the fewer particles I have, the less collisions I'm going to have. Okay, so here we have the same reaction where we're making butyl chloride. So I can, I can determine at any given um, point in this reaction what the instantaneous rate is, right? Because I can just pick a point where I want to measure it. I can draw a line um, tangent to the curve, right? And determine my slope, change in y over change in x. And I could do this for butyl chloride, or I could do it for butyl hydroxide, or I could do it for water, or I could do it for hydrochloric acid, right? So it depends on what I'm, what I'm tracking, but I can determine not only the constant, the uh, average rate for the whole reaction, but I can also determine rate at any given time. Now as it turns out, uh, most of the work in kinetics is done at the beginning of the reaction. That's typically where the reaction rate is being determined, because you know it's just going to slow as that reactant goes away. So the slope of the line, 
tangent to the curve is the instantaneous rate. All reactions are going to slow down over time. So the best, rea best indicator is going to be that beginning, beginning of the reaction. Now in this case, the ratio of um, butyl chloride is equal to my moles of butyl hydroxide. So they're there at a one-to-one -one concentration, right? So I, could, I would have the same um, rate regardless of which, which of these materials I followed. So the rate of disappearance of the butyl chloride is going to be equal to the rate of appearance of my butyl hydroxide. And actually what would happen is my butyl hydroxide would start off as zero, right? And it would increase its concentration over time. So the rate the rate of my loss of butyl chloride is equal to the rate of my gain in butyl hydroxide. Okay. So what if my, my ratio is not one to one? Here I have two hydrogen iodides creating one mole of hydrogen and one mole of iodide, right? So in such a case I just adjust, right? So my, the half the rate one half of this, the rate of this, is equal to the rate of this or this, right? Let's take a look at that. Let's look at an actual example here. So how is the rate at which ozone disappears related to the rate at which oxygen appears in the reaction 2O3 becoming 3O2? And if the rate at which O2 appears is 6 times 10 to the minus 5 molar per second at a particular instant at what rate is O3 disappearing? Okay, so if I, if I just think about plotting this, and I apologize, my lines are not too straight. So over time, time of the reaction, and I look at molarity, or I'm just going to put concentration here, my O3, let's say this, I'm starting with 1 molar or 2 molar, my O3 is going to do this, right? That will be my O3. But my oxygen is going to start at zero, right? And it is going to increase eventually to be a higher concentration in terms of molar concentration than my O3. Okay. So what happens here then it is um, the rate is going to be for oxygen because it's got a coefficient of, coefficient of 3 versus the coefficient of 2 for ozone it's going to have a rate that's 3 seconds of the rate of O3 okay so let's take a look let's take a look at a specific question if the rate at O2 disappears is 6.0 so I'm going to start with the 6.0 times 10 to the minus 5 meters per or molar per second what I know and the question is what happens to the uh, rate of disappearing of O3 this is for O2 right? and what I know is I get 3 moles molar of O2 for every 2 molar, I get these from the coefficient in the e equation, 2 molar of, of O3 right? So if I multiply that out, I get 4.0 times 10 to the negative 5 molar per second, which is usually you'll see written in the book and even on the exam as molar second minus 1, which means it's molar over seconds. Okay, so one of the things we can look at to really understand what's going on with um, reaction rates and concentration is to look at what's happening to the rate over time. Okay. So here the graph is a little bit different. You know, before what I was plotting was what's happening over time 
to my concentration and I'd have something like this, right? If we're talking about a a reactant and it, it goes something like this if it were a product. Okay, so here I have um, bromine and this is a reaction between bromine and formic acid, so bromine is a reactant, okay? And what I'm doing is I'm plotting the molarity or the concentration of bromine versus its rate, right? What's its change in concentration over time? And because it comes out as a straight line when I do that, because I get a straight line that goes through the, the y-intercept of zero, what I know is the rate is directly proportional to the concentration, okay? And if I know that it is directly proportional, I can change this rate to an equal sign by applying some appropriate or, or de determining some appropriate constant. In that case, we're calling it lower k. And that lower k, we can rearrange the equation, will be the rate over the initial concentration. And we call that k the rate constant. And if we're looking at the changing rate, which is what's the, uh, let me see, the y-axis here, this is the change in rate over my concentration, I get my slope. So it turns out that k is my slope. Okay, so if I want to know the the uh, the uh, constant, the rate constant for a specific reaction, I can plot the concentration versus the rate, and the slope of that line will be k. Okay, and in this case, um, I can take any of these these individual lines. And if I plot the rate over the concentration, or the rate over the concentration, I get something very close, right? It's almost, it, almost a perfect straight line. So K stays the same as my concentration changes, okay, and my rate changes. So a rate law expresses the relationship of the rate of the reactions to the rate constant and the concentration of the reactants raised to some power. So what does all that mean? Okay. So let's say I have this reaction. I have coefficient of A on reactant A and so forth with B, C, and D. Okay. So I can define the rate of the reaction as the, the rate constant K times the concentration of reactant A raised to some power in the reactant B raises some power. Here we are looking at just the reactants. When we're looking at rate, determining rate, we're going to use just the reactants. Okay. And we can also talk about the whole reaction being some order, right? So we can say there's a reaction order for A and a reaction order for B, okay? And that's going to be the power or the uh, exponent. And that there's a reaction, an overall order of reaction that is the exponent on A plus the exponent on B. So let's take a look at how we figure out what those exponents are. All right, and we typically do this by using rate data. You'd be given a, a, a table of data that has come from an experiment where a um, two reactants, two or more reactants have been mixed and uh, their concentration has been varied. Usually you're going to hold one constant, you're going to double the other and see what happens to the rate. So what we're going to try to figure out is what happens to each of the, these reactants as I change the rate. Okay, so I'm trying to figure out what my coefficients are going to be for my two reactants. So let's look at what happens when I double F while keeping ClO2 constant, right? So here ClO2 is constant. I have doubled F, right? 
So my rate goes from 1.2 times 10 to the minus 3 times 2.4 times 10 to the minus 3. So as my concentration of F increased, my rate doubles, which makes this a first order reactant. Okay, so X is going to be 1 for F. Okay. Now let's take a look at what happens if I hold my fluorine constant and I quadruple my ClO2. When I do that, if I look at what's happening to my rate over here, I go from 1.2 times 10 to the minus 3 times 4.8 times 10 to the minus 3. I also quadruple this, right? Quadruple the ClO2, quadruple the, the rate. So the, since they're the same, this is also going to be first order. So if I double one and the rate doubles, it's first order. If I triple one or quadruple one and the other triples or quadruples, it's first order. Okay, let's take a look at some more. So the rate expression then is going to be this constant K that can be determined from the rate data times the two react concentration or molarity, right, of the two reactants to the exponent of 1, which I don't need to write because it's, it's assumed. Okay, so let's take a look at another. So what is the order with respect to A? That's the terminology we use. So with respect to A, so let's take a look at where I'm changing A looks like right here I'm changing A whoops and keeping B the same so that one doesn't have B being the same staying the same so we're going to use this B stays the same and my A doubles and when I do that it has no effect on the rate it does not change the rate okay so I've added something as a reactant that does nothing so when that happens we have zeroth isn't that a strange word zeroth order Okay, so let's take a look at what's happening with B. So here I am, let's take a look at where we are doubling B and keeping A the same. So that would be these two, right? So when I do that, I go from 1.52 times 10 to the minus 2 to 2.5 times 10 to the minus 2. So I've doubled B, I've doubled the rate, so that is going to be first order. Okay, and the overall rate of the reaction is going to be the uh, exponent, addition of the exponent um, of both reactants, it's going to be a first order reaction. Okay. Alright, so let's take a look at what's happening here. So here we have, we want to know what's happening with chlorine. So I'm keeping NO nitrogen monoxide constant here, doubling chlorine, and as I do that, I can tell, see I'm doubling the rate. 1.43 to 2.86, same exponent, right? So if I double this, and I double this, this is going to be, chlorine is going to be, the rate with respect to chlorine will be 1. So let's take a look at NO. So here, chlorine staying the same, I'm doubling NO, and as I do that, I'm not doubling here, right? My exponent's going down. So if I take 2.86 and multiply by 4, I get 1.14 times 10 to the minus 5. So if I double my NO, and that causes my rate to quadruple, I now have a second order reaction. And basically, if I double 1, going to double, okay? So the overall rate of the order of the reaction is going to be 3. Just add them together. Okay, so rate laws are always determined experimentally, right? Run some reactions, change the concentration of one of the reactants, determine what happens, what effect it has on the rate while keeping the other constant. The reaction order is always defined in terms of the reactant concentrations. We don't do this in terms of the product. And that's because we're doing this 
with initial rates, right? We're starting in the beginning. The order of the reactant is not related to the stoichiometry coefficient of the reactant. It has, it's, not, it's not the same. So here's an example, right? I've got a uh, coefficient here that does not match the rate order. Okay. So let's take a look at this one. We want to determine the rate law and calculate the rate constant for the following reaction. All right. So let's take a look at how we do this. So let's take a look at, we want our rate is going to be K, some constant, S2, O8, minus 2, to some exponent times I minus to some exponent. We've got to figure out what these X and Ys are, right? All right, so if I keep my I the same and I double my S208, my rate doubles. So this is first order, right? So I'm going to say this is first order. I'll just put it up there. Do the same thing here. If I, if I keep this the same and I double this, this is also going to double. So this is also first order. So this is my rate expression. I, I can take away the the x and the y, right? So as i doubles, rate doubles. As s2o8 doubles, the rate doubles, OK? All right. So here's my rate equation. So how do I now figure out the rate constant? All right, so here's the equation. And I can take any one, it doesn't matter which one I choose, I can take any one of these experiments, because they should all end up being the same. The constant will come out the same. Okay? So here I know rate. I'm trying to find K. I know concentration of S2O8, and I know concentration of I. So all I'm trying to do is solve for K. So I can set the, rearrange the equation, and K will be my rate over the S2 O8 2 minus concentration times the I concentration, right? And I can pick any one of those. I'm going to just pick the first one. So the rate I get right from the table, 2.2 .2 times 10 to the minus 4, over the rate of, um, or the concentration of 0.08 molar S2 O8 times the concentration of 0.034. And what we get is now, be care you got to be careful here. The, one of the most common mistakes people make in the AP test is units. So this molarity and this molarity will cancel out, and I'll be left with this molarity, right? And the seconds are going to come down here. So I'm going to end up with 0 0.08 slash, meters are down here, the seconds going to come down here, 0 0.08 over molar seconds. Okay. All right, so we're going to stop there and talk about the integrated rate law next.